the shores, and we are missionaries serving in West Africa. Don't forget about us. Hello. Salut tout le monde. Go, go. Okay, thank you guys. Ça va là bas? Okay. Alyssa, thank you. Thank you. Mais je suis mignonne. Oh, oui, tu es mignonne. Mais allez-y. Mais euh. <laughs> you know, the, the Christmas season has begun, and if your family is anything like our family, you've begun decorating, and it's really looking and feeling a lot like Christmas. This is also a time in our local Baptist churches where we begin focusing on providing the Christmas offering. You know, this is just one way that you can participate in the advancement of the gospel around the world uh, through your local church. And we know, uh, we know that God doesn't need our finances to continue his work, but he gives us that privilege to be able to join with him in the spreading of the gospel uh, through the missionaries around the world. Our family is one of over 3,000 missionaries uh, sent out by the Baptist Church. And as you give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, 100% of what you give goes to support families like us. Yeah, that's right. And our work here in West Africa is not always easy. Uh, we face many trials living in a foreign country, and as well we work with the people who are less than 1% Christian. Yet the joy of seeing a person's eyes open to the gospel or seeing someone turn away from sin and follow Christ, um, and being able to train pastors, and also joining alongside the local church um, in seeing new churches planted, uh, all of that over overcomes uh, any difficulty that we face. Yeah, so this is our opportunity to tell you thank you. Thank you for the ways that you've prayed for us and encouraged us. Thank you for giving to us. Um, we just want to tell you thank you for the way that you've supported us to keep us here on the field. So kids, come, come help us tell them thank you. Merci pour votre soutien médical. Merci pour l'éducation que vous nous donnez. Merci pour la maison et la voiture. Merci pour les activités de l'église. Great job and thank you guys and, and thank you. Uh, giving is as easy as doing it through your local church, through the local church's Lottie Moon Christmas offering, or you can give online at imb.org. Thank you and have a Merry Christmas. I know many of you uh, know the Shores, and uh, we is one of the families that we know of that are with the International Mission Board across the, across the world. And of course, December is the time that we do take up the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions through the Southern Baptist Convention. So you will see perhaps on a seat either next to you or that you're on uh, this. This is, among other things, a week of prayer for international missions. So I would encourage you to take this home and use it beginning today as a way to guide your prayer to pray for international missions over the next several days. Of course, you can pray for international missions before, besides just this one week. But to take this as a prayer guide home with you today, You'll also see, I think they're in the backs of the chairs, so you can find one. Uh, there is a little envelope for Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And if you would like to give this year to the International Missions Offering for Lottie, of Lottie Moon, that, again, as they said in the video, 100% of that goes directly to support the missions on, field, uh, on, on the field. It doesn't go to overhead. It doesn't go to logistics. It doesn't go to administration in, in the United States. It goes to the missions field. And so uh, over this next uh, month or so, we will be taking up the offering to send overseas to the missions work of taking the gospel around the world. So I want to encourage you to be thinking about that as you make your Christmas budgets <laughs> this year. And we're going to be praying for them as well. So I'm going to read our call to worship. If you will stand with me, please. We'll pray and then we'll worship. From Psalm 85. Will you, Lord, yourself, revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation i will hear what god the lord will say for he will speak peace to his people to his godly ones heavenly father as we begin our worship this morning we pray for the shore family and so many others that we know who are across the world who represent us as a southern baptist congregation to take the gospel to every corner of the globe we ask this morning that you would give them peace and comfort and boldness and joy in the task you've called them to and may we, as those who have sent them out in your name, support them through our prayer and through our finances. Lord, as we gather this morning, may our worship be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. You who sing 
creation story now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Shepherds in the field abiding, watching o'er your flocks by night. God with us is now residing, yonder shines the infant's light. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. So all creation join in praising God the Father, Spirit, Son. Evermore your voice is raising to the eternal three in one. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Oh, come and worship, come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn King. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Inspire your heavenly song, Gloria in excelsis Deo, Gloria in excelsis Deo. Christ, whose birth the angels sing, come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King, Gloria in excelsis Deo, Gloria. time. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Y'all aren't awake by now. I don't know what will do it. You guys can be seated. <laughs>
We're reading from Isaiah 62, 6 through 12. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for my people. Build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him, and he recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Um, This comes from Luke 1, 26 through 33. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor in God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather today and study your word, Lord. I thank you for the many blessings that you have given us and your promises that you've given us to be able to study in your word, Lord. I just pray that we can be able to take these messages and apply it to our everyday lives. In your name I pray. Amen. Stand and continue to worship. What child is this who lay to rest? Lap is sleeping, who angels greet with anthem sweet, while shepherds watch our keeping. This is is Christ the King, whom shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in a mean estate? Where ox and lamb are feeding, good Christian fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. Nail spear shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail. Flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. The king of kings salvation brings, 
when loving hearts enthrone Him. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds God and angels sing. Oh, haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Oh, the babe, the son of Mary. Oh, 
seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. You may be seated. It is wonderful to see you this morning as we continue to, each and every Sunday as we move closer to Christmas Day, celebrate Advent, the waiting of the arrival of our Lord. As we take these Sundays to remind ourselves, or even this, these, this month, to remind ourselves what it was like for Israel to wait on the arrival of their Messiah. And even as you and I are gathered here this morning, we wait upon the return of the arrival of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know there are days, if you're like me, that you're going, you're going come quickly, Lord. Uh, we're tired of waiting. Uh, but in His time, He will accomplish all good things. So this morning, we are waiting. We are a people, much like the people of Israel were 2,000 years ago, we are a people who are waiting for their Lord to arrive. You know, waiting is not something you and I generally enjoy. Being delayed is not something that we tend to look forward to. About a year and a half ago, several of us made a trip to Chicago. Uh, uh, and uh, we were going to do some construction up there on the, on the church plant that we were supporting at the time. And I remember we, we left out of here. I forget what morning it was we left out, but we left out of here. And uh, we hadn't even gotten to Moralton. And the, uh, the main drive fan belt on, on, the, on the van broke apart. Woohoo! So it went out right as we got up to the Morton exit. So we just kind of coasted off to the, off the exit, pulled in. There's a little auto parts store there, and, and we were able to get into it. There was a truck repair shop right there. It was, it was about an hour and a half delay, give or take a little bit. And again, when you have a 12-hour driver in front of you, an hour and a half delay just blesses your heart, doesn't it? I mean, that just, that just blesses your heart anyway. But, you know, especially when you got a 12-hour trip, you just like to be Find your, you just like to find yourself waiting around, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, a few hours down the road, we're now in Illinois. We're out in the middle of nowhere on the interstate. I even forget what the, which interstate it was, but we're on the interstate in the middle of nowhere. Nothing but corn everywhere you look. And, and guess what? Traffic jam. I mean, there's nothing anywhere, and we find ourselves dead stopped on the interstate. Turns out there was an, an accident uh, a little bit up, that has shut down the interstate. It was such a bad accident. So there we were. We eventually ended up getting detoured. And as we kind of put the pieces together, we realized that that accident probably took place about an hour to an hour and a half before we had arrived in that area. Now, I don't know that we were spared being in the middle of that accident. I don't know that God broke that fan belt to make us wait. But we asked the question anyway. Sometimes God's making us wait has benefits or has things and has purposes it wants to accomplish that we may not even realize. Israel found themselves waiting for their Messiah, and even this morning we find ourselves waiting for His return. That's why we light these candles. That's why we do the Advent readings, to celebrate it, to remind ourselves that He is in fact coming, even if we have to wait for it for a while. This morning we're going to be taking a look at two different passages. You might not think of these as normal, quote, Christmas or Advent passages, but I think what we'll see this morning is that sometimes as we wait for the, for, for the coming of the Messiah, as we wait for the work of God, there are things that God does in our waiting. Last week we talked about what it sometimes is like to be waiting in the dark, much like the people of Israel were. Israel were. But this morning we talk about what does God accomplish, what does God do when He has us waiting. So if you will find, look up two passages, I want you to have uh, your fingers in Exodus chapter 2. We're going to begin there. And then also in Acts chapter 7. So again, I'm going to begin reading this morning in Exodus chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in verse 11. And then we'll move over to Acts chapter 7. In Exodus chapter 2 verse 11, the Word of God says this. It came about in those days when Moses had grown up, that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. 
And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But he said, Who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matter has become known. Now, if you will, join me in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, this is a passage we haven't gotten to in our normal studies through the book of Acts right now, but we will be getting there in, in the next uh, couple months. In Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 20, uh, Stephen, who ends up being the first martyr for the cause of Christ, is speaking to those who would eventually kill him. And in verse 20 of Acts chapter 7, Stephen says this, It was at this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been sat outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in word and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, he entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, your brethren, why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? You did not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, did you? At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the dark wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he approached he took, he, to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of, the, God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. Heavenly Father, as we approach your word in these two places this morning, would you Teach us, and through the power of your Spirit, guide us into the truth that you mean to communicate. And Lord, would you, even this morning, in the time we have together, change us and mold us into the image of our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, what does this have to do with anything this morning? Well, the reality is this. I want us to take a look this morning at Moses before he spent 40 years in the wilderness and Moses after he spent 40 years in the wilderness and comes back to Egypt. The Moses that we see as a younger man, as a 40-year-old raised as a prince of Egypt, and the Moses that will come back 40 years later after, after several decades as a shepherd who will, in fact, lead the people of Israel out of slavery. These are two different men. It's the same man, but they're two different men. And what was it that changed him? It will be what God does in the 40 years in between and the 40 years of waiting. Now you say, well, what, why was Moses waiting? What was he waiting for? Well, it's interesting as we approach this story, I'm sure almost every one of us have seen at least one or two or a few movies that talk about this particular story. It may be the classic Charlton Heston, Moses Ten Commandments story. It might be the, the animated one, Prince of Egypt, that came out a few years ago. But we've seen the story. We've heard the story talked about. We've referred to it at Passover, every Easter. Uh, we talk about it even sometimes with the Lord's Supper and talk about the Exodus. But we've, we've seen or heard the story countless times, but like so many things that become familiar to us, we may sometimes forget that the details may be different than we think they are. Sometimes you may have noticed that when you become familiar with something, you kind of forget the details. You don't notice all the stuff. And, and this may come as a surprise to you, but sometimes the movies that come out aren't always accurate. I know. Take your breath away, doesn't it? So as we look at this, I want us to see a couple things about Moses that was different than perhaps we might think. And we see Stephen, he's talking about Moses, and of course the story that takes place in Exodus doesn't give us some details, but Stephen does under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what we find out is this, that at the age of 40, Moses in Exodus seemed to have already known that he was in fact not Egyptian, 
that he was in fact a Hebrew. He also seemed to harbor some ambition as to be the one who would in fact deliver his brothers out of slavery. So we may think about Moses not so much later in life wanting to be the one that delivers his, his brothers and sisters, if you will, out of slavery, but he already had that ambition as a younger man. In fact, it seems to be his motivation when one day he sees an Egyptian slave master whipping a Hebrew man, Moses, already having the ambition to be the, the deliverer for his people, steps in, murders the Egyptian. Now, by the way, as we see here in Exodus chapter 2, this wasn't a spur of the moment, heat of the moment, passion take over you type of, type of a murder. Moses sees this, probably rightfully gets angry, and then looks around. He looks over here, looks over there. You know, when you want to make sure no one sees what you're doing. <laughs> he looks over here, looks over there, figures out the best way to handle it. And then after he's kind of plotted himself out, he goes over there, he kills the guy, and he hides the body. This was a planned out attack. And we see in Acts chapter 7 that part of the interpretation of this is that Moses was intending for the man he rescued and for the people of Israel to see what Moses had done and to rally around him and to see him as their deliverer. He was going to lead them to freedom. That was his goal. And what he finds out is that the next day when he shows back up and there's a little spat between two Hebrew slaves, he tries to break it up. They know what he's done. And on top of that, they aren't really all that excited about his involvement. In fact, they don't see him as their deliverer. And when he realizes that, and when he realizes that the news of his murder of this, of this guy is, is public, he hightails it out of there. And so what we see is a man who had ambitions. We see a man in Moses who I think probably saw an unjust wrong, wants to be part of the problem, there's nothing wrong with that, or wants to be part of the solution, nothing wrong with that. But... He sees what he thinks is God's plan of deliverance and tries to go about it doing it his way. And if you want to deliver a people out of slavery, what's the way to do it? You raise up arms. You lead a rebellion, right? Isn't that the way it's supposed to happen? Everyone picks up a sword. Everyone picks up a weapon. And you attack the Egyptians. Now, did the Israelite slaves have any real chance of leading an armed revolt against Egypt? No. What would have happened if Moses had tried to, to get the people of Israel to rise up and to threaten the armies of Pharaoh. What would have happened? Well, they would have been wiped out. That's what would have happened. It was the right idea. He, he's got the, the idea of delivering the people of Israel, but it's the wrong plan and the wrong time. By the way, you cannot solve and you cannot accomplish the purposes of God with human planning. Now that's, that's, a, that's a temptation for us. It's a temptation for people like me as a pastor who want to lead a church to do this and that. It's tempting to want to try to accomplish the purposes of God through human effort. But guess what happens when you try to accomplish the purposes of God with human effort? You fail every time. And what Moses is trying to do initially at age 40, is to accomplish the purposes of God, the deliverance of Israel, but he wants to do it with his own plans, his own ambitions, his own techniques, or his own solutions. So what are some of the problems here? Why would God's timing, why would God make Moses wait 40 years? Why would he make Israel wait another 40 years? Well, let's think about this for a few moments. We know that through Acts chapter 7 and Exodus 2, we know that Moses had been, uh, while born an Israelite slave, at the age of about three months, put in that basket, and you know he's adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter and raised as an Egyptian. We have every reason to believe that it, Moses, probably from a fairly early age, knew he was, in fact, a Hebrew. This was not a secret. Now, I know the movies, the, the movies will all tell you, well, oh, he had some kind of shocking revelation at age 35 or 40. No. Remember, without getting too graphic here, Israelite boys are circumcised pretty early on. No one else is. He knew he was different. All right? He likely knew he was a Hebrew from an early age, but he was still being raised in the Egyptian household. 
And at some point, he decides this is not right, and he wants to deliver his people. He sees a problem. He's moved to action. He even gets anger, angry, and he wants to lead a revolt. But how is Israel going to survive in the desert? How are they going to defeat the nation of Israel? How are they going to get to wherever it is they wanted to go? Would Israel even be ready to handle their freedom? I think we know the answers to these questions. A people the size of the nation of Israel do not survive in the desert on their own without some help or without some provision of God. People of Israel were barely able to handle their freedom 40 years later. You'll remember that when they do eventually get delivered, it's, the, it's just a few weeks. I mean, it's just a few weeks after they've seen the miracles of all the plagues and the walking through the Red Sea that they look back and say, let's go back. It was better there than it is out here in the wilderness. So God knows all that. God has his timing. And so what is God going to accomplish in the life of Israel and the life of Moses over those next 40 years that he leaves, he leaves Egypt after murdering the man and will come back 40 years later. Let me suggest that in, in, in Israel's life, in Moses' life, and in yours and I, in our lives, when God's timing is in our timing, when we see something even good that we want to see accomplished, and it doesn't happen when and how we think, that God may well, in fact, have a purpose in his waiting. He had a purpose in his timing for when Christ would show up. And he has a purpose in a time when Christ will return. He has a purpose in a time for all those things that happen in their lives. And even though you and I may want them to happen sooner, God has his timing. And so what's he trying to do when we have to wait? Let me suggest a few things. First is this, that God wants to build up within us a knowledge and a dependence and a trust in him. Moses, at the age of 40, probably had an idea about the Hebrew God. He might have known who God was. He might have heard the stories about his, about his Hebrew people, his brothers and sisters, had come to be in Egypt. He probably had heard the stories about the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. Now, I don't think he knew a lot of details, but he probably knew something of who God was. But he also had been educated in Egypt. He knew all the gods of Egypt. He'd been raised in that atmosphere and in that culture as well. And it's, it's my hunch that, I think borne out by, by Moses' activities early on, that Moses would have approached the worship of God in the same way he would have approached the worship of the Egyptian gods. And that is, you go through your rituals, you, do your, you jump through your whatever your ritual spiritual uh, uh, hoops are, you, you, you do this, you do that, you make the sacrifice, you say this, and you do that, and your God gives you what you want. Recognize that the God of, of, uh, of, of the Scriptures, the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob, the, our God today, when he introduces himself, when he makes himself known in the early world to, to ancient Israel, when he makes himself known to Abraham, when he makes himself known to Noah, when we have the records of even books like Genesis, the world that most people live in, the world that Israel lived in that day, was a world that believed in multiple gods. Israel had, or, or uh, Egypt had dozens of gods. And the way you worship those gods was they needed and required your worship. They need you to make sacrifices to them. They, they, they needed worship to be happy or to accomplish, to be a god. And so you gave them what they wanted, and they gave you what you wanted, a religious transaction. That's how you served your gods. And I would imagine that's probably the way Moses would have thought about Yahweh. But by the way, that's not the way our God works. Our God does not need us. Our God does not require our worship in order for Him to be fulfilled. <laughs> he does not need us. If you go to the book of Acts, you'll see Paul preaching in the city of Athens. And he makes a point of looking to all the gods, all these statues, all these, trib all these stone monuments to the various gods. And he says, the God who created us does not need us. He does not need you to make him a house. He does not need you to make him a sacrifice. He is not going to be somehow diminished if you don't sing just the right way. He's not going to starve if you don't make a sacrifice of food to him. The God, the creator of the universe, does not require us to do anything for him to be God. He is who he is. 
We worship Him because, not because we just want something out of Him, but because He is worthy of worship. You walk up to a mountain, you, you see the Niagara Falls, you see some awe-inspiring sight, and, you, and you're moved, you go, wow. Not because you're required to, but because it simply moves you to do that. You can't, you can't approach Niagara Falls. You can't stand on top of a 12,000-foot mountain over the Colorado Rockies and see the Continental Divide and kind of not go, that's impressive. <laughs> it's a natural reaction. You see it, you experience it, you encounter it, you go, whoa. No one's making you go, you better say it. Well, the worship of God is the same way. When we encounter the one true living God, there shouldn't be someone back there going, you better say you worship Him, you better say you love Him. You encounter Him, you will worship Him. It's just the way it is, it's who He is. So when we come together and worship on a Sunday morning, it's not that somebody's back here with a whip going, you better say the right things, you better jump through the right hoops, you better tie the right amount. It is that we encounter the living God and we are moved to worship. That's what's going on. So now Moses hasn't encountered the living God in that way just yet. He knows some of the stories, but he also has been educated in Egyptian gods, and he probably just sees the God of the Hebrews in the same way he sees all the rest of them. So is he ready to lead the people of Israel just yet? No. He doesn't really know God yet. He doesn't really trust God yet. He is not truly dependent upon God yet. He's dependent upon himself. Moses thinks, I can, through violence and a revolt, lead these people to freedom. And he can't. He thinks he can, but he's not relying upon anybody else other than himself and his own ingenuity, his own power, his own ambition. And when God will, in fact, deliver the people of Israel some 40 years later through the ministry of Moses, you will find a Moses who is utterly and completely dependent upon God and not himself. And that's going to be accomplished in that 40 years of waiting. God sometimes makes us wait so that we will, in fact, come to know him more deeply. We will become dependent upon him, that we will, in fact, trust in him. He has a plan. As a human being, you and I, we often crave control. We want to be in control. We want to be able to determine what's happening next. We want to have some say in the matter. I think one thing that sometimes frustrates us in a year like 2020, so much seems to be beyond our control. And all 2020 has revealed is not that we were once in control and now we aren't. It's just revealing that we never were in control. So one of the things that happens when our relationship with God is this. If we think that we have, if we buy into the illusion that we're into control, that things are in our hands, it's an illusion. And sometimes maybe God uses years like this to bring us to the point of utter and complete dependence upon Him and not our own ingenuity, not even our own devices. Another thing that may, God may be doing and revealing or in, in, a, in making us wait is He may reveal our motives our heart. Moses has the ambition. We see there in Acts chapter 7. He has the ambition to, in fact, deliver his people of Israel, deliver the people of Israel out. He wants to be the leader. Now, 40 years later, when God shows up to the, in the burning bush, is Moses real excited about being the leader at that point in time? <laughs> no. He's going, please, get somebody else. Now, everything about us, everything about our world tells us Moses, number one, who wants to be the leader, is the more qualified. And the Moses over here that doesn't want to be the leader, that's the guy you, you, you ignore, right? And yet, who's the one that God wants to use? The first guy, yeah, he wants to deliver the people of Israel, but he's also probably fairly arrogant, fairly proud. He's egocentric. He wants to do it himself. He wants his name recognized as a leader of his people. Moses, number two, well, he just wants God to do his thing. And sometimes it's in that waiting that God reveals to us what our real heart, what our real motives are. Are we more interested in our short-term gains and short-term pleasures and short-term success, or are we more interested in God's purposes being accomplished? Sometimes God makes us wait to reveal what those are. 
Next, let me suggest that perhaps one thing that's happening here is this. That God makes us wait, or in the midst of our waiting, is going to, He's going to crucify our idols. Now, what do I mean by that? Again, Moses is raised in an Egyptian culture and context. He knows all the, the Egyptian gods. Again, he's probably aware of, of God of, of Israel as well. But he was approaching God probably in the wrong way. And I would venture to say that Moses has probably got some wrong ideas about who God is and some wrong ideas about who the other gods are. Let me suggest a couple of idols that might have been in, in, in Moses' life. And I'm not just talking about the false idols of the Egyptian gods. By the way, it's one thing that's going to happen. Those 40 years that Moses is going to spend in the wilderness when he finally encounters God some years later on that, on that mountain, he's going to realize that the Egyptian gods are powerless and that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is all-powerful. He's, he's going to come to know that. And there's going to be a couple of idols that Moses will lose in the process beyond even just the Egyptian gods. Let me suggest this one. The idol of human accomplishment and human power. Moses has been raised in the most powerful nation on the earth in that point in time in history. <clears throat> By the way, most of us in this room have probably have been raised in what has been the most powerful nation of our time. There's, there's little doubt that, especially over the last 40, 50 to 70 years, the United States has been the preeminent military and cultural and political power on the planet. And you and I have been raised in that. We're kind of used to that. So was Moses. He had been raised in the most powerful nation on the earth. And he had been raised to believe that there was nothing that human beings in their political, military planning and skill couldn't accomplish. I mean, this is the nation that built the pyramids that still stand to this day. Thousands of years later, the Egyptians were an impressive society. No doubt about it. And so he was raised with that idea. Thought he could be the same. But the reality is, sometimes we make an idol of ourselves. We make an idol out of our own ability. We make an idol out of our human accomplishments. I, I love, I, you know, some of you know that I, I, at one point in time I wanted to work in the space program, I wanted to work for NASA. I, I, that was my ambitions. I was raised in the wake of the, the Apollo space program and the height of the NASA space shuttle and all that type of stuff. I wanted to do all that. And part of it, I mean, even today, I, I go back and watch documentaries and watch film and watch all kinds of stuff about the Apollo program and the landing on the moon and all that type of stuff. And you see those things and you hear those things and you look back on all those things and all everybody says, well, what wonderful human accomplishments. Look at the things that we accomplished. Look at our great technology. Look at our great ambition. We just decided to go there and we did it. Wow, look at us go. And we forget that there is a guy who actually put the moon there to begin with. Who holds the galaxies in his hands. And we're impressed by, by, a, by, a, by a few million miles. No, it's impressive what, what happened. But don't forget the God who spun the galaxies from his fingertips. Maybe that's the one we should be impressed with. So I think Moses had to lose this idea. He had, to, he had to lose the idol of human pride, of human accomplishment, and human power, and realize that God is the one who put humans here to begin with. Yeah, I think he also had to lose the idol of the immediate. Moses wanted to, he wanted to kill the Egyptian guard one day, and he wants to be in charge of leading the people of Israel the next. Now you and I are kind of the same way, aren't we? We want things done Yesterday, look at the panic our country went into when we didn't have the election results inside six hours. We want an immediate thing. A hundred years ago, six hours of election results would have been unheard of. Six weeks would be normal. We like the immediate. We want it done now. And if something makes me wait, I'm ticked off, right? We are slaves to the immediate. We worship everything that be done absolutely right now. Now, and when we have to wait, we assume something is wrong. Let me read for you a couple of scriptures 
out of Galatians chapter five, uh, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 5, verse 6. This is speaking to when God decided to send Christ the first time. Romans 5, 6 says this, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. These are just a couple of passages that remind us that the arrival of Christ that we're celebrating this month was timed out to the minute. The God before the foundations of the world were even laid had planned the timing out of Christ's birth in that manger in Bethlehem down to the moment. And when the time was right, God did it. Now, you and I might be imagining, well, why didn't Christ come a thousand years earlier? Or why didn't he come in 1950? Or why didn't he come this year? There's nothing in God's plan that says that Christ couldn't have come today, except that God in his infinite wisdom and in his timing said, this is the moment, this is the perfect time, and that's when Christ came. Now for us, it's in the past, but for the people of Israel, they waited over a thousand years. You go back to Abraham, God's promises to Abraham, it was a lot longer than that. Go back to Adam, it had been longer than that. We'd been waiting thousands upon thousands of years for God to send Christ before he finally came. And you and I now, we're in the same position, aren't we? We've been waiting at least a couple thousand years for his return. And people have been wondering, where is he, where is he, when's he going to come? When's he going to show up? I wish he'd show up now. It'd be really good if he'd show up right now. And he hasn't showed up yet. Why? Because it's not the right time yet. I don't know why. Out of my pay grade. <laughs> but he's coming. It's just a matter of time. Remember that God's timing is always impeccable. God's timing is always perfect. And so 2,000 years ago, it was just the right time for Jesus to show up. And whenever he shows back up, it'll be just the perfect time. In the meantime, there are things that God's doing. It might be one of those things he does for us, even for the church, is to move us from a dependence upon ourselves to a dependence upon him. To have us sacrifice the idol of the immediate as we await on him. To build our trust and knowledge of him. Something else that God may be doing through the waiting, and that is just to build endurance to train for the race, to be ready for the problems and the pain ahead. Those 40 years that, you, that Moses was in the wilderness prepared him for the role of shepherd that he would have for the people of Israel. Can you imagine the Moses of Exodus chapter 2? Got mad, murdered the guy. And apparently, as we understand in Acts chapter 7, he was distraught but because, because the people of Israel didn't immediately go, woohoo, Moses, our hero. And then that didn't happen, he left. Can you imagine that Moses leading the people of Israel into the wilderness and the first time they get cranky? What happens? Can you imagine what that Moses would have done? Can you imagine Moses, that Moses, the 40-year-old Moses, when they go out in the wilderness and say, we'd, be, we'd rather go back to Egypt? Him just going, okay, go for it, you idiot. <laughs> Can you imagine that Moses when God says, I'm going to wipe these people out because they're complaining can you imagine Moses interceding and praying for his people? No. Now, 40 years later, when God makes that comment, Moses begins to passionately intercede for Israel. God, don't do this. Can you imagine the 40-year-old Moses doing that? No. Look at all the things that God does in Moses' life and in the life of Israel to prepare them for their deliverance. He builds endurance. He transforms their character. Again, I want to look at Moses in Exodus 2. He sees a problem. He wants to, he's moved to action. He gets angry. He murders. He's violent. He's ambitious. He's trusting in himself. The Moses of, of, of later on is completely and utterly dependent upon God. There's a change. There's a transformation of the character. And maybe God makes us wait sometimes in the midst of our waiting. He prepares us to help somebody else along the way. It might well be that our waiting sometimes has nothing to do with us. It might be that our waiting has everything to do with what God's doing in the life of somebody else. Maybe he wants to, through our suffering, through our waiting, through our enduring, 
have the opportunity to encounter someone else who doesn't know the Lord, walk with them through their waiting, and bring them to, 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 to the Lord. It may be that's what God is doing. By the way, that's why it can be so damaging for us as Christians to sometimes come in church and pretend we don't have any problems. To, to, to insist that we have it all together. To insist that we aren't sometimes frustrated. See, when the world sees us and, thinks that we, and we think we have no problems, and we don't, we don't let them know, hey, listen, we, we're frustrated. We sometimes have questions. We wonder too. The world sees us and goes, well, they, I'm, I'm not like that. I need a place that people are, are struggling too. The truth is, sometimes it's in our struggles. It's in our waiting, sometimes our waiting in the dark, that God brings others around us and lets them realize that God does not expect us to be perfect just yet, that he actually takes imperfect people and through time transforms them. We, are, we so often want the world to be transformed before we let them come to God. It's not the way it works. This is a place, we are a people who lets God transform others in front of us, not makes them be transformed before they show up. That's what you and I are, that people. Let me ask you a couple of questions this morning as we think about what it means to wait for the arrival of our Lord, as we remember the Israel's waiting. How is God this morning wanting to work in your life as you wait? especially as we wait for his return. How is God working within us? Let me ask you this. Are you allowing God to work while you wait? Or are you stubbornly resisting his work because you don't like the waiting? We are people waiting or remembering the waiting of Israel as they anticipated the coming of the Messiah 2,000 years ago. Well, we are like the people of Israel then. We are even today a people who are waiting on the return of our God. As we wait, what is God doing within us even this morning? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful this morning that you are a God who sees and knows more than we do. Lord, we are slaves to the here and now. We are slaves to our own plotting and planning and power. We are slaves to our own anger and our own, bit, or our own ambition, the way Moses was. We think we can accomplish great spiritual things under our own ambition, just like Moses did. And yet, Lord, you have something to teach us while we wait for your return. Lord, I don't know where each and every one of us are this morning. But Lord, may our eyes this, this day not be on ourselves. Whatever darkness we may think we're in. May our, in the midst of our waiting, may our attention this morning not be anywhere else other than you. May we trust you and your purposes in the waiting. May we surrender our idols in the waiting. May you transform our character in the waiting. May we depend upon you in our waiting. May the truth of who we are and who you are be revealed as we wait. Lord, may our eyes be set upon you in hope and in peace as we wait. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and pray to lead us in a time of worship as we wait for the God who created all and gave us breath to accomplish all that he sets out to do. Behold our God, seated at His throne, come let us adore Him. Behold our King, none
nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Who has held the oceans in His hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at His voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God seated on His throne. Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore Him. Amen. I want to invite you again this morning to... Uh, Today, just encounter God and worship Him. Not to jump through some spiritual hoop. Not to get something you want. But simply because when you encounter Him, worship is what happens. And uh, I encourage you to do that as we wait for His return, whenever that may be. Just a couple of quick things this morning before uh, we are uh, dismissed. Uh, one is this, that... Uh, Lost my little announcement. Where did, I, where did I put my notes? There they are. Nope, that's the wrong page. There they are. Um, we are still, uh, th- those of you who are giving presents or, or through the joy tree for the children that we've adopted this, this Christmas, those gifts are due back no later than next Sunday. We will be distributing those to the families, most of those through the elementary school, the following week. So if you are one of those who are providing gifts for our joy tree families, would you please get those back to the church sometime this week, no later than next Sunday, uh, the 13th. Also, again, as we mentioned earlier, the Lottie Booth Christmas offering is going on. Take these prayer guides with you. Use them to guide your prayer this week as we pray for international missions. Take an envelope if you'd like to as well and use that to perhaps give something to the international missions effort uh, over the next few weeks. So I encourage you to do that as well. Um, we sent out a letter, probably didn't get mailed out till Friday. Some of you may have gotten it, but some of you may not have, uh, detailing some changes in our schedule starting in January. If you have not received that letter yet, you'll probably be coming in the mail tomorrow or Tuesday at the latest. I invite you to take a look at that, to read it. We'll be talking about that more in the coming weeks. Uh, but needless to say, I, we believe God's got something incredible for us in the year 2021. And uh, looking forward to what God will do. As we've been waiting some this year, uh, the next year arrives, and we are confident that God's got some great things ahead. So if you haven't seen that letter, it will be coming just the next day or so. Uh, here in just a few months, we are, we're going to actually dismiss here in just a few moments, but we are also going to have a called business meeting. We need to approve the 2021 budget for this church for next year. So once we dismiss here in just a few moments, I'm going to give a call to worship and all that type of stuff. Why don't you do that, if you would, those of you who are members, if you would stay, it'll take two and a half, three minutes, and we'll get the budget approved, and we'll be able to, you know, be able to do things that we're supposed to be doing come January 1st. All right. So, here we are. Romans chapter 11. Here is our benediction this morning from Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of his wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how unfathomable are his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we are dismissed.